ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Hero Movie Podcast, your greatest source for superhero movie discussion in the multiverse. I am your host, Adam Fortress, and I'm joined by Sean Caden. Heidi hates this movie. And of course, Bruce Leslie. I'm a prickly pear, and when you get Bilbo, Hagrid, and the Mad Hatter together, you know hijinks will ensue. Oh, indeed it will, man, because... Uh... Let me tell you, I I, uh, I, I had seen 2001's uh, From Hell, which is what we are actually reviewing this week. And uh, I this was before a lot of these people, like, they obviously had careers and stuff, but before they kind of uh, popped in their new way, you know, so to speak. And uh, yeah. we'll be talking about a lot of those people, because they're, they're in this flick this time. And uh, these this was... Um, the choice of this was actually brought about by our Patreon people who voted on last week's, and they voted on From Hell a couple of times where it's come in like second place and stuff, so they kept going, guys, we want From Hell, we want From Hell, and I, I don't know why they would want this, but that's what we're reviewing today from 2001, directed by the Hughes brothers, who've had a uh, you know, an up and down career, and uh, maybe this might be one of the bumps on the way, maybe this is might as well be, you know, Menace to Society Part 2. Uh I, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, but man, oh man, I, could we not have a show where uh, you know Bruce can get get to go into a little bit of Alan Moore? Oh yeah, come on. You you, you knew that was going to be part of the thing, and uh, and you've read all of this up until now, right? You so you reread from hell, top to bottom, raring to go. <laughs> uh, more or less, man. It's dense. It's dense. I'll tell you that. It It's definitely uh, one of those books you could kill a spider with, no problem. <laughs> For sure. It is phone book size, that book, man. That's, yeah. That's the one I picked so, up at the store once, and I was just like, hey, Alan Moore, okay, I'll check. Oh, boy. And, and, then and let me give you, the, <laughs> let me just go ahead and give you the full title of the comic. The full title is From Hell, Being a Melodrama in 16 Parts. Ugh, thanks, Alan Moore. <laughs> <laughs> Nine years to write. Oh. Wow, nine years. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, that is only because he did it with a quill pen. Uh, <laughs> really, really fanciful well, he, calligraphy he's got there, that, that Alan Moore. Really yeah, holding on at, to that wizard thing, huh? <laughs> if you look at it, you'll know that it wasn't the art that took a long time. Boom, I just called you out, Eddie Campbell. <laughs> Man, you're nailing that Campbell hot. That's some Campbell heat. Uh, oh, yeah. So we, uh, we're we going to take a look at that today, man. Why don't we go ahead and listen to that there trailer? Here's the trailer from hell. From? From hell. Hmm? Huh? Hmm? Nah, uh, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> Inspector, I know your reputation for making brilliant guesses that turn out to be right. Someone told me you claim to dream the answers. Sometime this evening, a bang tail was murdered in George Yard. That doesn't sound much out of the ordinary. It was the way she was done, Inspector. It was the way that she was done that cries out for a man of your talent. He can foresee the victims. I saw her. I saw her face. Your vision's about me. Most definitely. You know, they used to burn men like you alive. He could sense the suspects. It must be someone with money. And how do you know that? This ain't killing for profit. This is ritual. But for an inspector in charge of the world's most infamous investigations. He's punishing them. I want double shifts within this area. We'll have mayhem on the streets. I believe this was done by someone with a working knowledge of dissection. An educated man, that's preposterous. The last thing he expected. I want you and your friends off the streets until I can sort this thing out. I do trust you. Was to get close someone who would be next. Jack the Ripper's not finished. Where is he? I want him. See the 20th century. All 
Okay, that was the trailer from Hell, our retro review of this week. Here's the IMDb plotline. In Victoria era, era, London, a troubled clairvoyant police detective investigates the murders by Jack the Ripper. Should be of, right? I don't know that we do we do murders by murders by murders by Jack the Ripper. Uh, this is yeah, uh, that's, that's exactly perfect, man. Directed by the uh, Hughes brothers, starring Johnny Depp, Heather Graham, the only Americans in the whole darn thing, Ian Holm, Robbie Coltrane, and a boatload of others, including Jason and Fleming, who I like a lot. Uh, Bruce, this is an Alan Moore property. My guess is you got a little something, something for us. Only with intro music. Oh shucks, hold on. <laughs> Why is it? It's time for <laughs> Bruce's comic book connection. I hit the Thank thing you, on Sean. the thing, but it didn't play. I don't know what happened. It's there on the desktop. So I, I all right, go ahead. Gee whiz. From Hell, and I'm going to use the term that you love, Adam. From Hell is a graphic novel oh, by writer Alan Moore and artist Eddie Campbell, originally published in serial form from 1989 to 1998. Oh, you mean like so a comic can... book? Oh, so it's yeah. a comic book. All right, go on. <laughs> So you can say it was a long time in the making. Uh, the collected edition is 572 pages long, making it great bathroom reading for one whose diet is particularly low in fiber. Now, the inspiration for its name is the famous From Hell letter. It's an actual letter that was posted in 1888, along with half a human kidney, by a person who claimed to be the serial killer known as Jack the Ripper. The police received a large number of letters claiming to be from the murderer, over a thousand in all, but the from hell message is one of the few that has received serious attention as possibly being genuine. The letter was written at a very low literacy level with frequent spelling and grammatical errors, but scholars have debated whether this is a deliberate misdirection. The formatting of the message may point to it being a hoax by an otherwise well-educated individual, but some researchers have argued that it is the genuine work of a partly functional but deranged individual, much like Nerd Talk Now. <laughs> now, nearly all the characters in the comic are based on real individuals from the time of the Ripper affair. Mary Kelly is widely believed to be the Ripper's final victim. Spoiler alert, she dies in the comic just like she did in real life, though not in the movie. Uh, William Gall was a baronet and surgeon to the royal family that in the 1970s was speculated to be involved with the Whitechapel murders. In 1888, John Netley was a hackney carriage driver in London. In 1976, author Stephen Knight accused Netley of complicity in the Whitechapel murders in his book, Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution. According to Knight, Netley drove the coach in which Sir William Gull carried out the actual killings as part of a conspiracy involving the royal family and Freemasonry. Frederick George Aberlein uh, was a chief inspector for the London Metropolitan Police and a prominent police figure in the investigation into the Jack the Ripper murders. My favorite character, who was omitted in the movie, was Robert James Lee, a self-admitted fake psychic. The thing about Lee is he admitted that he was just making up all his psychic visions about Jack the Ripper, but when they started coming true, it freaked him out, so maybe he really was a psychic and didn't know it. Now that I think about it, it's pretty much uh, Whoopi Goldberg's character arc in the movie <laughs> Ghost, and man, we seem to talk about Whoopi Goldberg far more than one would expect given the topic of our show. Now, in the comic, there isn't really a mystery. It's made clear early on that Gull is the killer. In fact, on the cover of the collected edition is a picture of William Gull covered in blood holding a long knife. But we are taken on a journey of discovery as to why he's the killer. It turns out that uh, the purpose of his ritual sacrifices were to guarantee the dominance of men over women in the 20th century. And unfortunately, a brief review of the 1900s revealed that it must have worked. Now, in the story... When Gull finally dies, he travels through time and sees that he was the inspiration for Dr. Jekyll and Minister Hyde. Alan Moore has claimed that From Hell was inspired by Douglas Adams' novel, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, in that it explores the notion that to solve a crime holistically, one would need to solve the entire society in which it occurred. And that sounds like entirely too much work for me. Now, From Hell also explores Moore's idea on the nature of time. He uh, believes that all time coexists, and it is only the limits of our perception that make it appear to progress. This is one of at least two Alan Moore comics that season one of True Detective was, was accused of borrowing from, if not outright plagiarizing, a line from Top Ten. 
Now, when the movie was made, you may be shocked to hear this, but Alan Moore didn't like it. Who would the huh? He complained about Aberlene, who was gruff in his comics, uh, but turned into an absinthe sipping dandy by Johnny Depp. In truth, the character in the comic was intentionally drawn to look like Robbie Coltrane. So wrap your head around that one, folks. Uh, though the movie was largely forgotten, Moore can take great pride in the fact that the comic won him the Eisner Award for Best Writer in three consecutive years, and selling the movie rights probably bought him enough snake food to keep his deities fed for many, many months. But if you ask me, the single greatest thing about the comic is that it featured a cameo of Aleister Crowley as a young boy dressed in short leg pants. And for that, Mr. Moore is a true hero. Oh, I always love doing that Aleister Crowley in them pants. He's a good one. <laughs> the, the, I was, it, goodbye, it, That's a good Alan Moore. In all fairness, though, uh, Alan Moore described him as short leg trousers. Short leg trousers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Bruce, how many times have you read the book from hell? Uh, this is one that's not pleasant to read. It's good and it's well written, but it's one of those you read it once and then maybe if you want to like remind yourself about something, you'll look at a specific part of it. But it's not the kind of thing that's a pleasant read by any means. It's it's definitely uh, gruesome. Well, and it's uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is that uh, this is one of the books that uh, I just moved to the far left bottom of my uh, my trades and graphic novels and all of that jazz because. B uh, bottom shelf to the left means I never ever read it. Uh, I've read <laughs> I've read it one time. Uh, it is well written, but there is literally nothing pleasant about it. And and on top of that, uh, as you alluded to earlier, it's ugly. Like the 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 the, the artwork itself is ugly. And yeah. uh, whether that's done on purpose or you know, which I'm I'm sure there is there is a bit of that in there. It is it is wholly unpleasant to read, uh, but a far far better piece of work than this movie, in my opinion. Hey, oh yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody that would disagree with that. But it it actually uh, looks into issues, whereas the movie's trying to give us uh, an off center Sherlock Holmes story. I, I totally agree with that. The the other thing about it too uh, is the acting choices, meaning the casting of this movie. You know, yeah. Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp is fine. You know, uh, you need you need a big bankable star to sell this movie. I get why you bring in Johnny Depp. There are a million uh, British and English actresses who could play this role of Mary Kelly. So yeah. why why are you bringing in Heather Graham, who has the worst Cockney accent? Her Cockney accent is like mine. <laughs> and, and the dead giveaway that she's going to, you know, that Johnny Depp's going to fall in love with her, other than the fact that she's uh, an actress with name recognition, but the fact that her teeth are clean when everybody else's are really, they did a good job making those other teeth look nasty. Well, not only that, I, you know, like she's per like she's perfectly dressed. She's never dirty. Her hair is like not only is it clean, it's shiny and beautiful. Tough you thing know, like, to do when you're wearing fairness, the same costume over and over and over. That's literally she's like Superman. She's got one yeah. outfit. Well, it, this was Victorian England and they were street prostitutes, so she didn't have a wardrobe. I mean, I would believe her wearing the same thing every day, but it gets a little dingy, I would imagine. Oh, it's not that well, that's dingy. What, that's, that's what we're trying point. to say, is yeah. that yeah, for, somebody, for somebody who's walking around uh, 1880s London, one of the dirtiest times in the world, she is particularly hey. clean. We've seen the other ladies on the street. We know which one's bringing in the most cash, so she can afford the dry cleaner when the others can't. But in all fairness to the character, uh, Mary Kelly was the youngest of Jack the Ripper's victims and widely described as the most, the only one of them that might be attractive. I won't say the most beautiful. I'll say the only one that might be attractive. The only one might be attractive. What <laughs> what a what a great little mock here to you know hang your hat on. It's like, hey, she might have been attractive. <laughs> I am the prettiest waitress at the Waffle House. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. But um, uh. I think Johnny Depp would have been a really interesting choice for the character of Robert James Lee. Agreed. The, the fact that they melded uh, Aberlene and Lee basically into one character kind of bummed me out. Yeah, the, it, 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 and it also completely like shorts its own its own crap. You know where 
so is Johnny Depp a great detective or is is he having visions? It's one or the other. It can't be both things. And and in an Alan Moore story, uh, the protagonist, any kind of uh, story like this, the detective is not a good detective. He just is around as everything happens. Like he's the surrogate for the reader, the way that an Alan Moore story will be constructed. He doesn't right. know any more than we do, but he's learning it just by being there when it happens. So, you know, he would not write a whodunit with a Sherlock Holmes type character at all. And, and, you know, the thing is, he worked, he, he worked very hard to be as historically accurate as he could in his comic, but he also wanted to add uh, elements of fiction to it. And he actually put addendums and appendices to tell you, you know, what was real and what was based on other people's speculation and what was just his own outright uh, creative license, which is kind of cool. But in this movie, I mean, Mary Kelly is a historical figure who is a victim of Jack the Ripper, and she has a happy ending in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's so stupid. Playing a mall so, to the sunset. So stupid. And, <laughs> and, and it, there's the other there's the other thing that makes me insane about this movie too, and and I, and I just put it together actually, which is that it is it is it is fake intelligence. You know, the, there is a the, it's it's a dumb movie wrapped in. Like this, this should get nominated, you know, where the, the, the art direction is, is beautiful or beautiful. It's well done. It's not I, supposed I, to be beautiful. I love the atmosphere. I love the atmosphere 100%. It, to me, it's one of the things that saves this movie for me, not to tip my hand too soon, right. but I do love the atmosphere. This looks yes, like a I, high school play. Hey, it, it, I, it looks, <laughs> it looks great. And, yeah, I, and it, that is the one thing I will never, I will never say about about this movie poorly. Yeah, is that en- it, it looks terrific. I enjoy the atmosphere, and it's also a particular kind of time and genre that I've had a lifelong interest in. You know, Victorian England crime stories are one of those things I'm a sucker for. Uh, it's like pizza, even when it's bad. There's something good about it, unless you know, it's, there are always exceptions. But you get what I'm saying. Unless but, somebody is adapting your your hero's work poorly, <laughs> uh, but you know what I, I I I can deal with it, man. Compared to as someone who survived multiple viewings of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, I can handle from hell. <laughs> I know a guy who has a tattoo. <laughs> yes, I really do. I do. Yes, He's too, got a man, League that's... of Extraordinary Gentlemen tattoo on his arm. It's ridiculous. I'll never forget that story. It's gonna be the best. <laughs> I mean, come on now. What, but Johnny Depp. Here's the thing. Uh, they the Hughes brothers talked to other people about this role before Johnny Depp, and actually Johnny Depp was like fifth choice. First really? choice was Daniel Day Lewis. Hello, would have been amazing. He'd Sean, never say yes to this. Sean, no, he wouldn't. Sean Connery was another one. Jude Law was another one, and even Brad Pitt, all before Johnny Depp. But here's the thing, man. I don't understand what you know. Sometimes I don't know what impact the Hughes brothers had, and what might have come from above or beyond them. But why don't you have Johnny Depp as Robert James Lee, the most interesting character from history that's involved here, the most interesting character from the comic? I mean, it gets you get to explore the idea if a really uh, rational person was psychic, they wouldn't believe they were psychic. You know, and they would get freaked out about it. The idea that the guy is a self-admitted huckster who got things right before they happened, historically speaking, is a great concept to explore here. And Johnny Depp would have been wonderful as that character. You know, it, agreed, it's, agreed. But that what you're talking about right now is a far more interesting movie than the movie we have here. Oh, you mean like talking about the source material? Of course, it's far yes. more interesting. And yes. then you've already got you've already got Aberleen cast. I mean, Robbie Coltrane, give him a handlebar mustache, and there he is. I mean, uh-huh. there's no, I didn't make that up. Robbie Coltrane was the the sort of uh, base for the characters that was drawn by uh, Campbell, and it's just uh, so well, weird. I, I, Hmm. Alan Moore is kind of notorious for that, though, right? I mean, no, uh, no, John, not not so much. But, not but so Constantine, much Constantine is based on Sting, right? Yeah, because the artist said he wanted to draw Sting. Oh, I see. That wasn't and, an Alan and, Moore. And here it was the it was uh, Eddie Campbell wanted to draw Robbie Coltrane. I see. Yeah, so, so it's, it's not from it's not yeah. It, come, it doesn't come down. From That's Alan more Moore. of a Mark Miller move to say, you know what? I want uh, Nick Fury to look like Samuel L. Jackson and hope that he gets cast in that role. That's more of a Miller move. Hey, for, but, um, he got it. He pulled it off once, so God bless. Yes, he yeah. did, <laughs> and it, it it was good, man. I got to say, uh, I'm glad that Eminem didn't get cast and wanted like uh, Mark Miller had hoped. Yeah, yeah, that probably would not have been so hot. <laughs> or the Olsen twins as Hit Girl, but anyway, it'd be a different world. Yep, but um, 
uh, back with the movie, one thing I'll say, the uh, initial murders and the, the, they happen and they're gruesome, just like Jack the Ripper has to be. But I'll say that this movie, I think handled the gruesomeness of the murders in a pretty darn tasteful way. You know, we get the corner gagging, we get the people horrified when they discover it, but they don't turn this into a, a slasher flick, which would have been easy to do. I mean, it already had the R rating, so why not? But uh, I kind of respect that choice to make it about the story and not the uh, gore. Well, I think that they're tipping their hand just from casting, because at this point in time, you you cast Johnny Depp as the lead role in, in your movie. He is not, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean Johnny Depp at this point. He's 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 you know doing indie darling movies. He's he, he's 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 yeah. he's, a, he's a particular choice. So because of that, because you have Johnny Depp as your lead in this movie, you are trying to make a. You, you, for lack of a better term, uh, like a, an award and a, a, a present to an award show is basically what you're trying to do here. And so you're, you're not going to have it look like uh, uh hostile, you know, it's going to be, yeah. it, it's going to be something where it's, it's, it you, you, you get how gruesome it is, but you know, we're not doing close ups of the kidneys within the body cavity, you know, you're, it's yeah. not stuff like that. I could have used a little more of it. I'll be honest. But when uh, Sergeant Godley, Robbie Coltrane's character, goes to get um, Aberlene, uh, I was kind of shocked he's going into an opium den, you know, because that's not where Aberlene would have ever been, historically speaking. And then I get the vibe, okay, so Sherlock Holmes was famous for his 7% solution of cocaine and going into these uh, drug binges that would pretty much take him out of the scene and Watson would have to bring him back. And they're they're really trying to to make this a bit of a Sherlock Holmes story. And then the second thing I thought was, I'm kind of shocked opium dens haven't made a comeback with hipsters and speakeasies and stuff. It looks like that would be kind of the hipster's choice for crippling drug addiction would be opium dens. Come on down well, to the opium den, check in and check out, boy. Woo! With the big long well, you, pipe and the gummy ball of Play-Doh looking stuff. You're, you're living in the opioid era, so that, that that's where it's shifted to. Hey man, we're well, still guarding the poppy what fields. What I'm saying is like, uh, now, so. you know, you need the the hipster with the handlebar mustache and the plaid jacket to roll his eyes at the guy shooting up with heroin while he walks to the opium den and smokes his big long vintage pipe. Like opium is the vinyl of opioids. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I've without been, a doubt. Been saying it for years. <laughs> <laughs> Put that on the poster. It's like all the all the fun of opioids with none of those rusty needles or whatever. You know, you can see the appeal. I, I love it. Like he's got like they've they've got a whole like you know procedure for him and everything. It's like okay, we take a little bit of this, we put a sugar cube over there, we drop a little bit of that, pour some absinthe over. It's like oh my gosh, just get on and t- t- do your drugs, man. There <laughs> yeah, is a lot, lot of that. There is a lot of that in this movie too, it, as as you had said earlier. Uh, you know, th- th- there's there's just so many long drawn out shots. You know, we get it. You know, let's 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 move on, please. I kind of enjoy the atmosphere the first time, but then when they do it a second time, I have to agree with you. But Laudanum, nice to see Laudanum come back, made famous uh, by the John Wayne movie, The Shootist. <laughs> Is that where, is that where it was like the, if there was a a, a chart, this is where the peak is. <laughs> yeah, man. Because uh, John Wayne played that character that was uh, addicted to laudanum when, you know, he in real life was uh, taking heavy uh, pain medicine for his lung cancer that would eventually kill him his final movie. And he's kind of, uh, uh, let's just say under the influence of the necessary medicines he had to take at that time in his life. And it was kind of explained away by the laudanum in the movie. But no one knew because my voice was still as staccato as ever. <laughs> yes, Howard Cosell. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's another thing, man. He he does the opium. I think we're supposed to make the connection that it's the opium that gives him the visions, the psychic visions. But we never get any kind of Johnny Depp questioning whether or not to believe these visions. At the same time, we never have him like reference the fact that they exist either. And to be honest, they don't really help him any. He just yeah he or just my, gets to a couple of places where like well I've seen some things and there are things that may have happened that may have not happened you've been in one of them that's good so we're gonna think about that for a while and then we're gonna go over here and in in the in at least nothing and then we see the 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 working girls uh, all huddled together because the uh, uh, the protection racket you know I think they're called the Nickel Street Gang 
want to get their five pounds of weekly protection money from them. And one of their friends has a mysterious, wealthy uh, man who she married in secret and has a child with him. And we see these people pull up in uh, handsome cabs, well-dressed, and kidnap her and take her and the baby away while the uh, working girls are standing there screaming, worried about her. Um, uh, you know, I guess... If you know the histor the historicity, I guess, of the theories behind this all, you kind of know her role. But uh, and if you read the comic, you kind of know her role. I don't know if either of you guys can give any more insight than I can as to how the audience at large perceives that whole thing happening. Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm, I- it makes me glad that I'm bored during this time when when grapes are a, a big like. Hey, come on <laughs> over here! I got grapes. <laughs> and I, I kind of miss the good old days when all you needed to lure in a victim was grapes. Now it takes like Applebee's gift cards or something. <laughs> Applebee's. I gift have cards. some seedless grapes here. Seedless grapes. No, thank you. How about a twenty dollar Applebee's gift card? Who they got two for twelve rolling on right now? Hell, let me get on over to that van. <laughs> I'm the only guy in a horse drawn carriage in my town offering grapes to people. So I think I've already been marked by the cops. You're the only guy in your town in a horse drawn carriage. <laughs> Sadly, I'm not. But the other two guys, theirs aren't as cool as mine. Let's talk about horse drawn carriages <laughs> for Amish. half a second. What? <laughs> Let's talk What's about horse drawn carriages for a second. How proud was the prom department or whomever of that step ladder that they made? Man, not only were they proud of it, but it was a really, like, in the real world, a very impractical design because having two things that could gash your foot on either side of a place your foot is intended to go seems like a design flaw in my it's world. It's so over the top and dumb, and but they are so proud of it. That thing comes, like, like, they show that thing shooting out no less than six times. It's ridiculous. Look, we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on these little steps, so... We are going to show these little steps. <laughs> is, there, is there somewhere tucked away a version, a draft of this script where Gull is a vampire? I don't know who that is or what it was. Uh, Gull think, is uh, the surgeon who was Jack the yeah, Ripper. The surgeon. In this movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. With the eyes, you know, his eyes go bananas. Yes. The, yeah. uh, the, uh, uh, I, I don't think so because I think that we're still in that room. We, we talked about this during the second Fantastic Four movie. We're still in that point where, like, screenwriters, like, well, I know, I know better than the whoever it was that wrote this, <laughs> who wrote this comic book. It's just a comic book. You it's know? not like you won awards for it or anything. Well, I, but I think that, and you're not wrong, but I mean, you know, this is still during a, a, an era where every everything comic book is kind of thought of as second class even if it is alan moore from you know from a screenwriter who doesn't have nearly the chops that alan moore has and so my guess is is that you know they're sitting in a room somewhere like i like this i like this i don't like this i don't like this hey why don't we make it why don't we blend these two characters together into one character brilliant let's go home guys I, I feel like there was some point, though, where they were going to make Jack the Ripper a vampire or make Gull a vampire because those pointy things on the end of the stairs kind of look like fangs. There's one scene that they never get back to. It's like a drop thread where he actually puts some blood in a glass of water and drinks it. Um, there's a couple little things that make me think at least someone was toying with the idea that at least they want us to think it's a vampire. I just felt like there was a little bit of vampire imagery that was sort of done half-heartedly. Did you guys ever see that movie with David Hasselhoff? I think it's a TV movie where the London Bridge is disassembled and like put back together in like Phoenix or something like that. And the and Jack the Ripper mysteriously shows up again. Yes. <laughs> no. That was Isn't like that from a- 1988 or something, man. I remember as a kid thinking, what is this boring movie? And then all of a sudden Jack the Ripper showed up and I was in love with it. Uh-huh. And it was it, like, I, I don't know anything about it. I, I should have done some research, but I just thought about it just now where uh, Hasselhoff has to figure out uh, who Jack the Ripper actually is. And he figures it out. And uh, uh, and, you know, so the, the mystery of who Jack the Ripper actually is ha- has been solved in the Hasselhoff verse. And anyway, the reason why I'm bringing this this whole thing up is that uh, that is a more believable story than, <laughs> than than what they're shoving down our throats in this one? Uh, I don't know, man, because uh, uh, I think that the story is fine. 
uh, in some ways. It's because I know the source material that it gives me sure. problems. Sure. And the historicity bugs me. But I do feel like as proud as they were, that step stool is what brought it up, which had totally impractical spikes that looked like fangs at the bottom. Somewhere somebody wanted there to be a vampire in this and movie. No and no one says, like, watch your step, ever. Yeah. <laughs> and it's there, there was a little bit of con. There was just a little bit of a continuity issue with Nedley's ear. You know how Nedley, that's the name of the guy driving the cab? Yeah, oh. Jason Flip. Yeah, he has the mangled ear in every scene but one. There was one scene where his ear wasn't mangled, and that bugged me like way more than it probably should have. I was playing games on my phone while this movie was playing, I'll be honest with you. This time well, maybe by the end I'll remind you why I didn't realize I'd watched it the first time, but it's uh, salty. <laughs> it's a little bit of a salty story. Oh, man, uh, nice. Nice, I like but, salty. But they take Anne, that's the name of the lady with the baby, the uh, one who has the paramour that's keeping her up, that, that she says is a painter named, uh, uh, I think they said his name is Eddie Sickert or something like that. But in real life, there were. this is another composite character, uh, the prince, you know, who comes into play at the end. We find out it's the prince who's the father of the baby. Uh, he had a friend who was a painter named Will, William Sickert in real life who was supposed to have been privy to... He was supposed to have been a witness at the marriage, essentially. So they've taken the prince and made him the painter, which I, I don't know why you even need the painter aspect in it if you're going to do that. But anyway, they take her away and they do a lobotomy. You know, they have a whole gallery and they're watching and they, they decide the way they're going to shut her up for good is to do this weird three point lobotomy, which has never been done in all the history of disgusting lobotomies that I'm aware of. And also uh, lobotomies. Uh, particularly the kind they're sort of referencing here uh, were transorbital lobotomies. And those were really a very American thing started maybe around the thirties or forties in the 20th century. Like this is way ahead of its time with the lobotomy process in the comic. Um, what happened is William Gull removed her thyroid gland and then she had severe myxedema from not having a thyroid gland. And interestingly enough, in real life, William Gull was a surgeon who was noted for his extensive studies in myxedema. So, you know, that makes more sense. But here we'll just do a lobotomy, have a different surgeon performing it to try to throw us the turf ball because they're trying to make it a whodunit. But I don't know. Did you guys pick up that the transorbital lobotomy just was all wrong in this movie? Of course. I, you know, uh, you clearly have not listened to my lobotomy podcast. I'm a little <laughs> offended. I'm a teenage but, uh... lobotomy starring Sean Keenan. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's funny. It's funny. The rabbit holes we go down on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet rabbit holes, pun intended. I'm more of a funky mixology of the, the that was in the eighties, but that was a little later. And then when, uh, <laughs> John, uh, John, when Johnny Depp meets Bilbo Baggins for the first time, they actually hit it off. Like they're going to be friends. You get the idea. William Gull is going to be his, uh, mentor and help him against all the bad guys in the story, which once again, shows you they're trying to make a whodunit here rather than an exploration of motives and human darkness like the source material. Well, I think so, but at the same time, too, like, I mean, isn't that kind of how we would sort of see it as, you know, because we don't really, if memory serves here, we, we don't really know who Jack the Ripper technically was, right? So right, we don't, we don't, but like I said, the source material we know that William Gull is who they're saying is Jack the Ripper, and right, right, we're right. just going along with the ride for why. But yeah, exactly. But I mean, on account of no one that's watching this is like, let's be honest with ourselves. Ninety nine point nine nine percent of people that will go to see this have any idea that it even is a comic book thing, much less have yeah. actually read it. Right? <laughs> yeah, there will be a few William Gull fans that go to see it, but not many. William Gull was my grandfather. No one says that. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. <laughs> he even uh, writes a couple of prescriptions to Johnny Depp to help him out with his opium addiction, you know, and that would have been the perfect uh, opportunity for him to poison the guy if he wanted to. It's like he's playing this uh, little cat and mouse game that's sometimes famous from thrillers and things where the, uh, the Hannibal Lecter type character just wants to tease the person chasing him. I so have, do you like that or not, Bruce? Do you like the, the game he's playing or do you think it's too cute? I I think that uh, it's fine. It, my problems all go back to just uh, actually, I think it's fine. I think it's fine. I uh, just know what's going on and it would work better if I didn't know what was going on, I guess. Uh. 
I just wonder when the phrase chasing the dragon actually came down the pipe because I just don't believe it was during this time because there's at least two different occasions where somebody just goes, hey, man, you've been, uh, you've been chasing, chasing the, dragon. the dragon. Yeah. <laughs> like, we, we called it that back then? I don't, think that's, I don't think that's accurate at all. Man, uh, you know, I think chasing the dragon came around right about the same time grapes were banned for luring people to their deaths. That's, well... <laughs> It was a it was a uh, red letter year. It was. <laughs> You'll have to do this with raisins from now on, buddy. No, <laughs> no more great bait. Nobody's coming to the cabbage for raisins. Oh god. And great bait. Uh, great bait. Someday will we find out that the stone cutters really did do something bad? That's like man, one of those just biggest tropes ever is all the evils of the Freemasons. Yeah, it, it, you know, it, and I know that it's in. I know it's in the source material. I. It, it, and and maybe in 2001 it was a new idea or a newer idea, but you know, watching it with 2018 eyes, it it, it it it's just one of those things where it's like, yeah, okay, guys, the yeah the Freemasons did all this. Well, I it, think I think blaming the Freemasons for everything ill in society goes back a long time, and that's why it's in the source material. I mean, it was in the theories in the 70s that influenced the source material. But, man, I, I just hope someday something really gruesome happens at a Mason's Lodge just so all these people will be vindicated. <laughs> I'm more of a stonecutters kind of guy myself, but that's just me. <laughs> hey, they keep the metric system down. <laughs> and Rick every Oscar <laughs> night. But in make, the, make Steve Gutenberg a star. <laughs> one nice thing of, uh, about the, the comics theory is that the Freemasons are opposing the Illuminati, so you have to choose which secret society you want to throw in with. Ooh, that's a good one. I don't know. Because, man, choose? I'll tell you, I've been to, you know, I've driven past our local Mason's Lodge, and those guys standing out front got nothing on Jay-Z and Beyonce. Yeah, I got to I gotta <laughs> say, I think I'm going Illuminati here. I think uh, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to smell very musky going into the, the Freemason <laughs> kind of thing. I'm pretty sure my uncle was a Mason, and he wasn't smart enough to, to do this kind of stuff. <laughs> Well, what? you know, like like everything else, it starts it starts with a great idea, and then you know <laughs> everything gets watered down after a while. You know how it goes. Nothing's cool once one of my uncles are in it. I'll just put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> they'll let anybody in. <laughs> but uh, uh, one thing that the source material does have going for it is it was published before the Da Vinci Code, which is when I think the the real flush of Freemasonry is evil kind of hit. Oh boy! Can oh. I can I tell you how much I just hate Dan Brown? It's just I just I just think he stinks. I've never met the guy. I I've met him in person. He was at a McDonald's and I kicked him in the face right after he ordered three triple you know double quarter pounders and I was just like, get out of my face, dude! You're taking up way too much time. And I tripped him. It was funny. Now you want the to only part random... I believe about that story is that you were in McDonald's. You go straight you want... to from hell. <laughs> you want to hear a random combination of name drops here? Yes, please. I knew a lady who was married to Noam Chomsky's nephew who once dated Dan Brown. <laughs> what a bizarre huh. turn. I love that. Huh. So, yes, if you're listening, Amy Chomsky, I'm talking about so you. So you could say you you're know. basically best friends. <laughs> she said that he was not as cute as her husband. Oh, boy. <laughs> Noam Chomsky's <laughs> nephew being her husband. Man, oh, man. <laughs> uh, but, here's uh, the thing. I, yeah. I want to I go into this real quick because I feel – like we have some people out there that know, okay? Uh, because I look at our numbers, I know, I know, I know where our listeners go, and we've got it. We got a decent amount of listeners over uh, over in the in the UK area here. Guys, please email in to me. How bad are all these accents? Because now, granted, uh, Johnny Depp and um, Heather Graham are really the only you know proper Americans in this, say for maybe one or two way way down the line. Uh, but man, oh man, am I drive driven bonkers by the accents in this flick? I mean, like even the people that are from like, you know, that, that are from England proper still just like, is, is it all the North accent? Is that the one that's, that, that makes you think everybody's a dummy? And, and, <laughs> and this is coming from the guy who, uh, criticized Pierce Brosnan's Irish accent. Yeah. So his, take it with a grain yeah, of salt. Yeah. That one sucked too. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the Irishman's accent was way off. Uh, listen, but, it was terrible. Go see that movie. His uh, is it's awful. So Not the movie is accent. What do you What do you guys think of the actual conspiracy at the heart of this movie? The fact that Prince Albert has syphilis that we I guess are supposed to assume he uh, contracted by his uh, 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 prevalence to hang out with ladies on the street and. Uh, 
that's kind of what draws Gull into the whole situation where he has a secret child who is in direct line to inherit the throne, who's the daughter of a prostitute and a Catholic to boot, which, you know, if you're not familiar with the whole Anglican church, they're not big on Catholics, I guess. Well, it's like Grandma always said, if you don't want to have the syphilis and a kid out of wedlock, don't do the ladies who do the stuff. So, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. I know my my grandma said never go back to Victorian England and hook up with a streetwalker if you're royalty. Huh. <laughs> you know, it's it's solid. I mean, the the conspiracy itself is solid. The, yeah. the, the, and, and I like it. Uh, there, there, there is a bit to recommend itself, this movie. You know, the, the, the problem, the problem is that it takes so long to get to all of this. And, and, and it, this is another movie where it feels like they're punishing you to continue watching it. You know, do I, I wanted to do anything else while watching this movie? It's and, weird and because that's like, not a good sign. When I when I was watching it, like the first like the first half, I'm just going, man, this is moving along at a click. I feel like we're oh crap, we're only halfway through. Jeez, I thought we were like just about to wrap it up. But man, oh man, man, it takes forever to get there. This thing is two hours long, and it feels all of three. Well, it's it's an atmospheric movie. I, I mean, I'll tell you that much. It's it's one that's meant to be sort of like uh, felt more than watched, I guess. But. They did nail. Oh, the I casting. felt it all right. I felt it in the in the sleepy department. <laughs> they nailed the casting on a uh, uh, makeup and and wardrobe and casting all together on Queen Victoria because that lady sitting there is Queen Victoria, man. She nailed it. <laughs> I uh, I have I have no thoughts on the Queen Victoria lady. Except... So I take it you don't you're not a big fan of Liz Mosscroft, the actress who played Queen Queen Victoria. Huge, huge fan. Who amongst uh, us? Uh, but the 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 problem is is that what else is that lady gonna do? <laughs> I mean, she <laughs> looks just like her. Uh, Thankfully, she, the BBC ha has constantly at least four shows about Queen Victoria. <laughs> well, time. you are not wrong. They they do love <laughs> they do love their Queen Victoria. Uh, but, I, you know, I I just realized I don't have a whole lot to say about this movie. You know, uh, thankfully. <laughs> Bruce does because yeah, because there's there's actually a Freemason named Ben Kidney, and then later half a kidney shows up at the police station, which is based on true historical fact. I've been like, so, uh, clearly you've done it. You did. I'm like, your namesake shows up here. What do you what do you think this is? We're stupid or something? This is clearly you. And uh, I mean, we're really set up to think that Ben Kidney is the baddest, the most despicable person in the movie. And I, I do love the casual. Uh, uh, anti-Semitism from the police chief guy, that George Lusk character, is like, well, surely this was the Jews, or maybe it was those Red Indians from America pointing at the old uh, Buffalo Bill, Annie Oakley <laughs> show bill. I thought, I'm just like, what, <laughs> what, what, what planet do you live on to where they're just like, well, maybe they came over here to start killing some folk. I think they got plenty of folk to kill <laughs> well, over there in America. A little bit of historical context, uh, the, the uh, Buffalo Bill Wild West Spectacular was in London around the time of the uh, Jack the Ripper murders. Okay, fair enough. But I, I thought we were just like, uh, would, would he just like take <laughs> just a vacation? Randomly, he's so racist, he has to find a way to blame an, a red Indian from America. <laughs> I love the idea. I, I do love the idea of a movie about a guy who's trying to blame the Indians <laughs> for all the Jack the Ripper murders. <laughs> and he like, tries to shoehorn every bit of evidence <laughs> <laughs> back to... The Indians. Oh man! But in so a way, good. but in a way, <laughs> this movie great. also kind of does that. Weather over there. The movie. <laughs> no, sir. It's a nap. It's a. It's a. It's a handkerchief. Are you sure it's not a feather? <laughs> this no, movie kind of does that though, because he's always he is. You said it, Bruce. He's always just like, but it's the Jews, though, right? It's going to be the Jews. Yeah. And like, Aren't it the Jews? And they're like, no, it's you clearly not the Jews. <laughs> it's the Jews, though. These slices were made with tomahawks. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the precision. Only a stone tomahawk could be done but that way. <laughs> well, boys, if it's you case closed. This right, these are buffalo tracks, not hoof, not horse hooves. <laughs> it makes nothing but sense. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're looking for a red Indian riding a buffalo with a feather in his cap. Okay, police chief, we'll put out the old APB for that one. Draw up the posters. <laughs> <laughs> And also, I don't know, man, the strange way they spell Jews in this movie, I did not expect. I like how he well, points that's, over that's, to it and he just goes, real, though, this is it? spelled is it, correctly. Is I'm, real? I'm sure it's real, man, but it, it was not something I expected. 
Uh-huh. Listen, from somebody that can't spell regular, I just looked over there and got like, I'm not a bright man, but when Johnny Depp points to something that I, at least as far as my 21st century brain says, it's not how you spell Jews and goes, hey, that's spelled correctly. And I'm like, is it though? Are, are <laughs> you like, are you so I'm, dumb that you think that that's spelled correctly? Is this, is this on you or what? What's the deal? I also like it how... Uh, uh, just sort of for no real reason, halfway through the movie, uh, a French woman shows up. <laughs> like, oh, great! Now there are two attractive prostitutes. I was about in to London. say, at least they brought in another attractive one instead of like, hey, we brought another street urchin over here who's got nothing to, you know, sell her by. But just like, at least this one's attractive. But her whole purpose in being in the movie was to give some kind of explanation for why everyone thinks Mary Kelly was murdered when she wasn't. So they could have at least made her a redhead, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, why is the French lady here? Like, why Why is she in the movie? What, what's the explanation given for why there's a French prostitute all of a sudden? Because Liz just walks into the bar and goes, look, I found a French she, prostitute. She's like, I found somebody. This. Honestly, that's how it goes down. Yeah. There's no Liz more explanation than that. And then you're just like, oh. OK, you brought a pretty lady along. Why? Uh, just, how about you shut up? Because I, I also think in 2001, you know, when this movie was made was a time when people uh, still thought it was OK to, to villainize uh, gay folks because they kind of make Liz the more despicable one of the group. And they add that whole dimension to her that I think is just movie stuff, not source material stuff. Uh-huh. And uh, that was just all kind of weird because they show her like having an interest in the French girl and then having forcing herself on the French girl, then fighting with the French girl and going out to get drunk, and then she gets murdered. That just seemed, to like, to me, that all seemed like just happenstance in order to bring the story along. It didn't seem like that, it didn't feel motivated from anything other than, how do we get her from here to there? And yeah, they had they to, they had to, they realized, it's like they made half the movie and realized, okay, there are five victims, we've only introduced five ladies, uh-oh, we need... We need for for Mary Kelly to live, unlike real life. So we got to figure out a way to pull that off. Okay, we don't need to do any reshoots, but my cousin from France is in town, so let's just put her in the movie. My cousin. <laughs> wow. Because uh, you know, if she were if she were in the movie from scene one, she's the one Johnny Depp would have had the hots for. That's true. Wow. Well, knowing Johnny Depp, yes. Uh, did anyone catch, because I didn't, but this is the uh, screen debut of one Dominic Cooper. Really? Yeah. He's constable number three. Uh, I kind of looked <laughs> Is he for one him, of the ones with the bucket of water? Probably. I, I, I just I looked for him, and I still couldn't find him. So I was just like, I, I'll take your word for it, IMDb. But uh, this apparently was his uh, movie debut. Well, I, I will say this. When I looked at the constables, I did think number three was the most talented. <laughs> you know, that number three looks like he might be on an AMC hit series in a couple of years. <laughs> Would you call it a hit series? Uh, hit-ish. <laughs> <laughs> got a third season coming. That's something. <laughs> that third season's coming because Sarah Pale had opened her yapper. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> it's a series. Whether or not it's a hit's open for debate. There you go. See, series. Yeah, but um, everything has to be a hit if you if you just announce it on the thing. That's that's how half of these darn things work. And I thought at the end it was a weird to make the bold choice to give Mary Kelly a happy ending, but then try to take the artistic high road by like saying, "Well, in the, in the, real, in the real world, it would be uh, tragic because Aberlene knows he can't go after her, and then Aberlene dies in the opium den." Uh, that that was all just. Um, an odd hodgepodge, a potpourri, if you will, of approaches to the story there at the end. So dumb. I, I love the, the great, like, hey, some time has passed. Here's a little salt and pepper in that hair and a little bit up there in the chops. Doesn't he? And I love how, like, I love Johnny Depp's wispy high school mustache in this. It's just like, <laughs> what is going on here? Seriously, that's like what a 13-year-old grows when hey, he just goes, like, I my s- dad looked like that when he was, like, you know, in 1970-whatever. I sported one of those bad boys at 18 years old, so it happened. <laughs> <laughs> like that's the like I don't I'm not a facial hair guy, but like a mustache could be the only thing that I could do. Apparently, that's something Johnny Depp just struggles with getting is the mustache portion. And then uh, I I kind of wanted to know what the next case was that was so important. Robbie Coltrane had to go into the opium den and dig him out. Like I would have liked to have heard it was something cool, but you know we don't get to find out because Johnny Depp's dead. And then Coltrane just like. With the, the the movies love that one single swift hand motion that closes both eyes simultaneously. Have either of you guys ever tried to close the eyes on a corpse? 
constantly. It's harder than it looks, man. You don't just sit there and w- rub your hand over it and they magically close. You got to really kind of pull down and then stitch them to get it to stay <laughs> Sometimes you got to sometimes you got to kill enough people to be able to say that maybe it's something like different on someone else. Let's try, bang. Uh but what was it uh there's somebody that's done some comedy where it's just like, nope, c- come on, open up, close, close, darn it. Uh but I think they uh like in uh the Richard Linklater movie Bernie, they actually uh show how they go through and glue the eyes and lips and all that stuff together. Are you sure you're not thinking of Weekend at Bernie's? Nope, that's just called Bernie. Okay. And the guy in the jack. The third one is going to be called Zom Bernie. (laughs) Ooh, (laughs) I would watch that. Uh, But no, it's, you know, here's the thing. And, but I do like the, Bruce, let me ask you this. You as a man who has done the, the, done the procedures and whatnot. Do you have like some sort of awesome attache attache case that you open up that has all of your awesome like utilities and and whatnots in them? If you don't, not you should. one, not one with nearly that many shiny sharp objects. Oh. And, uh, I mean, I have a call bag, but it's mostly like lenses, condensing lenses, and light sources nowadays. But like, back in the old days, I had a reflex hammer and a stethoscope. Get you some like scoopers or something. I don't know what they do with those sort of. I don't. <laughs> is that how they do with eyes? I just go in, scoop them out. I might have some tiny scissors, but drop in some uh, saline solution, you know, pop them back in. You bring and up, <laughs> you bring up a good point. The whole cat and mouse game. I mean, goal at the very beginning of the movie goes. Maybe he had a uh, surgical kit just like this one. <laughs> and I also, I also like it when Johnny Depp says, "Here, have you ever seen a knife like this?" And takes chalk and draws a knife that looks exactly like every knife I've ever seen, particularly when drawn by an eight-year-old. <laughs> You've seen this knife? It, it, this one look like it, it looked like a go from a dinner knife. It's this I one mean, right he here. Not draw just like your standard any knife at a restaurant that's going to be in your. Like the only room. difference was like he drew like four lines up by the handle, and he just goes, "Oh, well, that that knife. <laughs> that's a piercing blade." It's and like, then he goes oh. and pulls out one that looks nothing like what was drawn, but very intimidating. Johnny Depp did not get far in the in the other arts <laughs> in school. He just is like, I can act, but I, talk if I can't draw, boy. Yeah, but but Sean, don't they bring in an expert to do the chalk drawing? Like you don't actually make the actor draw what's on the chalkboard, do you? It depends on the it depends on the actor and what the, you have them doing. Like sometimes you even have to write out things on paper and on chalkboards and whiteboards but sometimes the, the, the actor wants to do it themselves see i have this narrative where johnny depp did it himself in the first take and it was like an alex ross art like it was so <laughs> realistic and perfect they said we can't do this sorry johnny here here let's go get let's go get that uh left-handed kid to draw it with his right hand i see the hughes <laughs> brothers sitting behind the camera going <clears throat> we're gonna let him do it and that's that's gonna be what we're putting in there for real no seriously <laughs> let's, no it's a joke Shh, don't, they're gonna see he's gonna see oh no good job there mr depp good job very good <laughs> Oh man, it, it, that that part was like some great unintended humor. Have you ever seen a knife like this? And he draws exactly what I would draw in Pictionary for knife. <laughs> <laughs> a knife? Have I seen a knife? Yes, I've seen knives. What do you want from me? <laughs> Ooh, what is Look this at strange the object? On that knife. <laughs> what is this strange <laughs> object you have drawn before me? Are you some kind of wizard? <laughs> It's either a helicopter or a knife. (laughs) (laughs) You sir, some sort of wizard. I'm just, I'm wow. This is amazing. Uh, But let's get down to the important part here, kids. Before we go to our review and tell you everything that we thought about this movie and maybe a little bit more, we have to find out what the other and more is in our lives, and that is how this movie relates back to a guy called Sylvester Stallone. I thank you, Adam. I have a prepared statement. Mm -hmm. Peggy Trentini is a former model and actress, and I think a friend of mine named Bruce Leslie should do a Google image search for her because I think he might likes what he sees. What's that name again? (laughs) Peggy Trentini. T-R-E-N-T-I-N-I. Oh, gotcha. Mm -hmm. She's been in 24 different projects with names like Carnal Desire, Virtual Desire, and Human Desires, three movies completely independent of each other. I'm not judging, of course. We've all done things we're not proud of. For instance, I saw the movie Nuns on the Run in the movie theater. As a teenager, (laughs) I looked to see what was playing at the movie theater, and I made the decision I wanted to see Nuns on the Run on the big screen so I'd miss nothing. Now, Peggy Trentini would have been yet another forgotten pretty lady if it weren't for her self-published tell-all book entitled Once Upon a Star. 
in it. Ms. Trentini names names and also gives very accurate account, accounts of how some very famous people like to do the stuff. Who exactly? Billy Idol, Mick Jagger, Nicolas Cage, Sean Penn. <laughs> You're killing me, Bruce. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sean Penn, Kevin Costner, Vince Neil, Sting, and Johnny Depp, just to name a few. She recounts that of all the celebrities she's done the stuff with, Depp was the most romantic, claiming that he once went over to his house and he had a picnic complete with blanket waiting for them on the roof of his house. Now, that's some high-level baller moves, so good job by you, Mr. John Christopher Depp, because let's face it, he didn't have to do that. He's Johnny Depp. This is the Johnny Depp. He's this is the Johnny Depp before he's the guy who's constantly wearing stupid hats in his movies. Johnny Depp, and because this segment is known as the Stallone Connection, you HMPers have probably figured out that Peggy Trentini also claims to have had relations with a guy who undoubtedly made sloppy advances on Dolly Parton while filming <laughs> Rhinestone, <laughs> Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> Peggy Trentini claims that in 1991 she was, quote, his girl, unquote, on Mondays and Thursdays. If that sounds like a low point to you, please understand, Peggy Trentini also dated Fred Durst. I was about to say, that's what I'm seeing pictures of, is her and Fred Durst. <laughs> and I'm just like, what in the wide world of sports? She was a For vampire. You, for you younger HMPers, Fred Durst was a guy who was famous in the 90s, and thankfully, <laughs> only in the 90s. Amen. A Stallone connection with a book tie-in wouldn't be complete without a review of Peggy Trentini's book. And thankfully, someone by the name of Cheryl on the website <laughs> Goodreads wrote of a review of What's Upon a Star for Us. <laughs> Cheryl writes, and I'm quoting, Sometimes my job can be really boring. I could sit there for a couple of hours without seeing anyone, so I tend to dig through the boxes of old books on site and read them to make the time pass. This is the most recent book I used to get through the day, and thankfully, I didn't pay a penny for it. <laughs> These days, this book would be labeled fan fiction because that's exactly what it is. I don't believe half of what this woman has written and claimed to have done. She probably did sleep with certain people she names. Let's face it, Motley Crue and Poison? Mm. They had sex with anyone who crossed their paths on any given day. I just don't believe <laughs> the emotional side of some things. Too many things not right with the Vince story. The Depp one seems way off and total fantasy, as does the Costner and Penn stuff. Well, thank you, Cheryl. I totally owe you a high five if I ever see you in public. Cheryl, you and me could be like Thelma and Louise, except I'm a self-obsessed, mean-humored internet radio personality, and you're clearly a very lonely old lady. But <laughs> we'll always have that high five, Cheryl. We'll always have that high five. And there you have it, HMP. Here's this week's Stallone Connection. Now, human poo smelling back alley and filthy hands, <laughs> the two things I think about most when I think about London in the 1880s. Let's rate from hell and send it back to, man, it's got to be an easy reference here. But for the life of me, I cannot <laughs> think of what that might be. Anyway. Manchester. <laughs> Manchester. Oh, boom. Uh, now, the Hollywood press calls uh, Once Upon a Star simply delicious. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> That's a book cover, oh. the quote. <laughs> oh, simply delicious. Simply delicious, says the Hollywood Press. All right, here on Hero Movie Podcast, we have our own patented Robin rating system. Check it out at facebook.com slash Hero Movie Podcast. Bruce, where does From Hell fall on the patented Robin rating system for you, sir? Well, I've got to tell you that I thought this was the first time I'd ever seen this movie. Uh, and after watching it yesterday, I came out and said, hey, I just watched a Jack the Ripper movie with uh, Johnny Depp in it. And my, my wife said, oh, that one that we watched back in 2004 in the cabin in Gallatin, Tennessee. Wow, and I said, specific. No, I've never, <laughs> I said, no, I've never seen this movie before. And she said, do you remember that time we went to the cabin in Gallatin, Tennessee in 2004? And I thought about it. I was like, well, yeah, I kind of do remember when we went to that cabin because we weren't married yet, you know. So things were a little more interesting back then. And she said, well, that that movie was playing in the background. And I was like, wow, I'm kind of impressed that I don't even remember that that movie was on because not only was something else going on to keep my attention, but it was going on long enough that it lasted through the whole movie, I guess. <laughs> but then I started thinking, but she very clearly not only remembers the movie, but a lot of plot details. <laughs> and that kind of bummed me out a little bit. But anyway, long story short, I kind of like the movie. 
believe it or not. I know I had a lot of negative to say about it. It wasn't mind blowing. It wasn't world changing. But for me, it was a nice atmospheric movie in a time period in a place that I find interesting. It had actors I like. I've definitely had worse times reviewing movies for this podcast. And I'm going to give it just a ho hum, middle of the road, Damian Wayne. This movie will bore some people, but it didn't bore me. <laughs> she said Johnny Depp was stilted the rest of the weekend. I don't, I, you know, it's just say, uh, Sean, what do you got? Um, I, you know, I, I, I can't stand this movie, but I, I it's not the, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not filled with vitriol and venom and hate towards it. Uh, I got to give it a Stephanie Brown. Um, it's long. It, it, it's not, it's no fun. Uh, it, 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 you know, when you have limited free time, the last thing you want to do is, is watch this movie. Uh, so for me, it's a Stephanie Brown. Yeah, I'm on the Stephanie Brown train as well. Like, it's not good. I can't go so far as to say this is a Jason Todd because it's it's not that that bad. But it's just there's certainly nothing to recommend it. Um, I mean, if you've seen it before, you've seen it, and I don't know that you you'll go like, boy, I can't wait to go back to this on a regular basis. It's it's empty calories. There's nothing much to it. The accents are just all terrible. I I I don't particularly like the way most of this movie looks and uh, even despite it having a couple of great actors in it even they are still you know being pulled to their limits as to what they can do with this material which is not very good and uh you know the Hughes brothers this was like their first kind of like real big outing outside of you know what they were kind of used to doing they did like menace to society dead presidents and stuff and then from hell was like their big kind of uh, you know feature debut and everything and they've really only done like book of eli since then that's really kind of caught on and even that didn't do super hot so uh i wish better for those guys and but uh this this is a big miss for me so stephanie brown and and you know in all fairness to them they were i don't know they were given a tough chore to say let's make this period piece in victorian england which is so far outside their oeuvre oh yeah they're like, oh, we need to get the guys who did the American Pimp documentary to go over and uh, and and do this like silly Johnny Depp, mo- and it's like it's a bit much, man. Uh, so that is it, everybody. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Next week we are going to be talking about the first four episodes of Happy. Uh, that's available on Sci-Fi right now. They're, uh, I think they're only doing about eight episodes altogether. So we're going to review the first half of that and see if it's worth watching. I haven't seen any of it as of yet, so uh, I'm looking forward to it because I've heard some good things. In the meantime, where we might be able to hear some more good things, I think our friend Bruce Leslie might be able to help us out with that. Hey, man, I just want to remind people about Nerd Spawn Genesis. It's the funniest superhero story that will make you smile, grin, giggle, and perhaps even chortle. Go find it on Amazon. It's the only thing listed under Nerd Spawn, N E R D S P A W N, all one word. Check it out, please. Thanks a lot. Will you also plots? How about that? Huh? Never mind. Kanan? <laughs> uh american animals please uh check out the movie american animals it's good uh i i like that i worked on it uh it's a movie and you should see it american animals uh and uh the film fine we should be back uh within this next week or so so uh check out that matt may be back we may have some other people on as guests because he's got a lot of things going on uh but believe you me i've been seeing movies i think i already got what six or seven 2018 films under my belt as far as you know this year already so uh we're rocking and rolling man uh so that is it everybody join us back here next week when we're talking the first four episodes of happy for sean keenan bruce leslie i'm adam portress stay super everybody Bye, Marty and Evie.